Hello and welcome. This is Fever Dreams Podcast, Season 3, Episode 5, Episode 18 in total. And we are recording this live on the 31st of July in 2022. I'm Corm, your host. I have my co-host, Saifa Orion, with us. And our very special guest from Starcade Arcade, that is Alexander Clark. Down here. Hey <laughs> Hello Hello and welcome. Clark. Thank you very much for joining us today. We will have Excited a lot of questions, especially Cypher will have a lot of questions, I guess, as he is the Unity developer. <laughs> I, I, I am indeed. I am indeed a Unity developer. But I, 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 I don't believe that I am as much a Unity developer as Alexander the Clark. That's, that's why you can ask all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I can share, open book. So yeah, all right. Good, as usual, we should probably start off with our, our normal question. What do you think? Yeah, what have you been playing? What have you been playing? What have you been playing, Alexander? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. There is a game that I'm currently obsessed with. I have always seen it like on TikTok, and you know, it's just like one of those classic games I've always seen the title for, but I underestimated how quickly i would get immersed in this game and just obsessed and that's subnautica <sighs> i even like made a joke about this game on my tiktok before i had ever played it and then it was on xbox games pass and i was like well let me go see what this game's all about and like i would have to say hats off to those developers it's one of the smartest game designs i've ever played because it's very free form which i appreciate um, but the level progression is just very clever how they keep you like glued into it and exploring more and more. So I feel like every time I talk to somebody, I'm like talking about <laughs> Subnautica, which I think the hype was several years ago. I'm always late to these sort of things, but I am thoroughly enjoying it. <laughs> I feel it. you there. I feel you there. 100. No worries on that one. <laughs> I played it years after release. Years after yeah. release. It was for how many years in early access? It was long time in early access uh but, yeah, but you, i was looking yeah and I, you mentioned that i was looking into that too that it sounds like it was a game that really was made successful by the community that the support through early access really helped these devs and so now that i know that story too it makes it even cooler i haven't looked into the second one yet uh what's interesting I'm trying though, not to is uh, you mentioned it's it's clever um gameplay wise uh, as you are a game developer, you can, yeah. you have a different eye on that than we as a gamer or as players have, because I mostly just enjoyed the atmosphere. I, I, I enjoy being able to look far underwater. That, that's just an awesome feeling. And I had this little claustrophobic feeling when you went down to the, uh, what was the river oh, yeah. called? You, you, you find down there. And yeah, yeah, what is your eye on that in the gameplay mechanic you mentioned? Yeah, so I've been trying to increase my mastery <laughs> as a game developer. And so I've been reading some books lately that were recommended about game design. And one of the things that I've read about is like the human psychology of like motivation, you know, like what motivates a player to accomplish tasks and there's a very fine line if you're playing like the carrot and the stick game you know mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. if you're dangling a reward in front of somebody then it has short-term incentives and goals that prompt them to continue playing you know if we're talking about a game continue playing or, or continue achieving um but you have to do it at the right intervals and you have to do it unexpected if it's expected and they don't get it after a certain amount of time then they lose interest they get bored they quit playing and so it's i've just i've been learning that it's a very fine balance and then when i go to play subnautica i really feel like they achieve this balance because essentially what they do is you know for anybody who who isn't familiar with the game the concept's pretty simple you're playing crash lands on an alien planet that's pretty much all ocean <laughs> and you have to survive. I think you're trying to get off the planet. Don't know, haven't finished the game. <laughs> but um, for the most part, you're just trying to survive. And it starts off very simple. You start crafting your basic items to stay alive. You know, 
you get food and water from some fish. Um, but then the way the game design is, it pushes you further and further under the ocean. Mm-hmm. They have it. It's, it's open. Technically, you can go anywhere. You won't survive if you do. And, and that's part of the incentive is you're learning how to craft equipment that, you know, helps you explore further and further, helps you survive. Um, but they do a great job of incentivizing you to explore because you have things such as like blueprints that you got to collect and you get like these messages of things to explore. You'll randomly come across you know, a a structure underwater, which piques your interest, but then that leads you to another one. I just feel like they did a really good job of keeping the user engaged, but also still giving them a lot of freedom in their choices. Correct. Yeah, I I feel totally the same. What got me a little bit more hooked was the sci-fi story behind it, because it unveils the that this planet has been inhabited before and something Mm -hmm. bad happened and you well it's part of the story and i don't want to spoil it for those people who haven't played it yet because that's totally part of the adventure to explore Uh, but you have to progress in the story as well to beat the game because yeah you crash on a planet and uh, a goal is of course to get off that planet again but you can't and not right. only because you don't know how to build the spacecraft to, to do it, but also uh, the computer and stuff won't let you because something happened to you and you need to fix that. And you are fixing more than only yourself then. And exploring yep. that was, was when I came to the first alien island, that was mind blowing. It was I so well done. I was oh. so excited. <laughs> I was like, what is this? I didn't see this coming and and I've been really good about like not looking up stuff, even like I don't want to look up. I mean, somehow I miss this. I don't know why I'm out of the loop sometimes. I just am. But like, I didn't know a whole lot about the game. I knew you're underwater. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's some aliens. Um, But so part of the fun's been, I haven't looked up the creature designs. And so I get the pure terror of when I'm swimming along and then I'm like, oh, what, the, what, <laughs> what is that? Is that? <laughs> what is that yeah. one creature called? There are some leviathans. Not only one, That's there right. are two or three or so. The first time I encountered that one, I was like, nope, nope, nope. I turned around, <laughs> I swam in the opposite direction. Nope, nope, I, I don't need to go there yet. We are, we are noping out of this situation immediately. Please don't call. Yes. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I told a few people about the game, and I think it was my dad, who's also a gamer, and he was like, so do you fight them? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not going to fight them. <laughs> it is a note for me. I'm like, no thanks. <laughs> so you're, you're one person swimming in the ocean, and you encounter a man of war. What do you do? Run Go away. <laughs> yeah. You craft an exosuit and fight it. What? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> that that sounds more like a gamer response, honestly. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. I treat it as a real world. I'm here for survival. I'm sure. Yeah, that was also for good, me the only thing I knew game. about the game that it's a survival game. And I didn't know that there is a story behind it. I, I just knew. I, yeah, I didn't know that. That either. was so mind blowing in that moment. Yeah, but you're right with I the uh, with the carrot that is always uh, giving you the hint when you find or you will find a blueprint because there is like an audio lock or something where it tells you you will find things over there and then you explore then you find the blueprint but then you realize okay i have the blueprint i can build now a submarine but i need these and those ingredients to get those i have to do this so there's always on the horizon i will get this bigger thing and that keeps you motivated that's true that's interesting to hear from a game developer's perspective yeah And they do a really, really good job of keeping it open ended, because if there's one thing I don't enjoy, it's like a suffocatingly linear path. Mm. Um, I just I never got into games where you played through a story. I know some people have a soft spot in their heart for them, but like if I'm told exactly what to do, it kicks off some type of rebellious streak where I'm like, no, I don't want to. (laughs) And so I like I tend to like the open world games. And so normally, if you told me you have to collect three parts of a blueprint and then these ingredients to build something that could be a suffocating experience. But the developers have done a good job of keeping it open 
one of the re- one of the ways specifically they achieved that was putting multiple instances of each blueprint. What I mean by that is not every person who plays the game has to go to the exact spot to build the same thing. You can accomplish it multiple ways. I may find mine in the mushroom tree region, but mm. you may have found yours near, you know, the shipwreck. Like they they leave it open so there's multiple ways to achieve it, which I think helps with the freedom of the game while still leading me along yeah. and keeping me addicted. I have to admit though that was confusing to me at first. When I realized you can find it somewhere else and I think you when you find it you get some ingredients instead of the blueprint again. And, right. and I was like, wait, d- didn't I have this before? This is weird. Until I found the next instance of, of a blueprint or so. And then I just oh that's how it works. Okay, you, you get extra stuff. Ah. And and that's where like it is a tricky line for game developers because going back to like the human psychology, the first time you found a blueprint and it was one you already have, my guess is you were disappointed and you were less incentivized to find another blueprint because now you're thinking, oh, well, I won't necessarily get a new item. I'll just mm-hmm. get this ingredient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like so the diminishing returns you get from the uh, like the drop things in arc. Kind yes. Of, you know, the, yeah. Yes. Well, because it's like a dopamine high is the first time you get it, you know, a little bit incentivizes you. But then like you need bigger highs to incentivize you, which in the case of Subnautica, you can build a build a hella big submarine. You know, they keep like upping the ante, which, which again, you have to like I can't get excited about crafting a knife anymore because I did that early on. Right now it's got to go big. I want a big submarine. Mm-hmm. You, you can you can feed the human psyche bigger and bigger numbers until you have to give them different visual things and then bigger and bigger numbers basically right <laughs> right if you want to break it down to the most like basic components of game design <laughs> i mean humans are pretty basic when it comes down to it <laughs> truthfully, truthfully. <laughs> um so did you finish the game already i have not Okay, good. <laughs> There's still I just more to go. into like the, the magma region, so I, I oh. think I'm getting close. Yeah, but it's still a little bit ahead, though. Oh, it, it's okay. so good. I, I'm lucky. I would be. I would like to be in your situation to to re-experience <laughs> that again. fresh because the first time experiencing Subnautica is is awesome. It's really good. It is. It I is. need to look into the VR mods again to see if the the quality on those is better because the the VR support. Uh, from the outset, I was super excited about it. Like when I heard that it had VR support, that's when I got the game because like my thing's kind of VR now. And I was just the the controls were super disappointing. Mm-hmm. Was, they were clunky. They were hard to use. But I'm I'm really interested to see if if they've been updated yet because I really do want to get into the game. And it's just like the whole being in VR and being in one of the scariest places that I can think of seems like a good time to watch you know <laughs> yeah definitely yeah i was also playing uh, the integrated vr well it's an add-on it's not the game wasn't meant for vr initially so they implemented the vr mode uh, afterwards and uh, i got motion sick i couldn't really play it i, I played it like yeah, one I'm session really and then i mm-hmm. kind of had enough it was working the immersion was good but the movement got me motion sick so I played it more or less in pancake mode, also the non-VR mode. But you're right, there is a flat screen to VR modding Discord. And I think there is even a mod for Subnautica. And I was like, uh, why is there a mod if uh, the game does have VR integrated? But maybe it's what you said, Cypher, that it's improving the experience. But I haven't tried that yet. I actually have to look into that, but hearing you you both talk about the game and thinking back on when it first came out, I'm like, yeah, I actually still really want to play that. <laughs> I just want the, the full VR experience so that I can get that immersion and absolutely freak myself out for the <laughs> yeah. entertainment of others. <laughs> We'd all enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a taste of it in ARC, um, back when ARC still kind of sort of supported VR. Threw on VR headset and started walking around. The, the controls in that were even worse than most bad ports. Um, but I got into the water 
and I was swimming around and all of a sudden an ichthysaurus, you know, an ancient dolphin swims up next to me and it spooked me so bad. I had to like take off the headset for a second. <laughs> I was like, oh, 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 right. Yeah. I'm okay. We're, we're fine. We're fine. <laughs> we're fine. The immersion was amazing. amazing. Uh, That's what I that works great for me with spiders. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Oh, right. Oof. Spiders in VR. No. <laughs> Do not play propagation VR then. Okay. No, can't do it. Okay, okay. skipping that one. Okay. It's, it's not based arcade arcade, and that's what we're talking about right now. <laughs> so, um, any other games that you've been playing recently that are worth digging into? Oh, that one's pretty much taken up most of my time. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I mean, it's it's a game that you can spend hundreds of hours. I mean, they added base building, and then you are free to do whatever you like. Uh, I think yeah. in the end, I had like three bases at some strategic points because you're running out of oxygen. And if you don't yep. have that one, I don't know, there's one generator that generates oxygen for you. I can't remember. It's quite a while ago. But yeah, I had then stations or bases at some strategic um, points. There's an entrance where you could use one. And later when you're down there, you could use a base and get the stuff done. So you can spend hundreds of hours in this just building bases <laughs> yes definitely <laughs> all right uh Saifa, what have you been playing then lately well mostly when, I, when i'm playing things that aren't what i'm working on um rocket league play a lot of rocket mm, league so, soccer car and uh legendary tales um legendary tales is like uh I, I think i've talked about this one before it's like diablo in vr it's like Diablo Dark Souls but in VR like all the enemies have really interesting attack animations and they'll like adjust during an attack to try and trick you or like actually get around your defenses and it's just a lot of fun running mm -hmm. around slash slashing skeletons with swords and axes and maces and shooting them with magic and, and bows and arrows and things like that and all the loot because you know Diablo-esque games are all about the loot who doesn't like loot? Right. It's, a, it's a good time. It's some good exercise. And I still haven't gotten down to level 10 to fight the butcher. <laughs> a couple hundred hours at this point. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I still need to get back to it with Nina, too. We have, uh, we have not continued yet. So Nina Grimm's daughter, fellow, uh, or Fever team member, fellow streamer. Yeah. <laughs> So, you have played? Yeah, I have uh, I have this uh, project, which I like to call the pile of fame, because I don't like to call it a pile of shame, because there is no shame <laughs> in buying games and support game developers. Most of us, That's most right. of us just call it our Steam library, but... Yeah, it, it's a pile of <laughs> games. <know> <laughs> a pile of games as well. <laughs> and uh, from that, uh, I, I'm playing the games one after the other. And the current game I started playing a few weeks ago is uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Okay. Which is also open world. So after I finished uh, Death Stranding and Cyberpunk with over 100 hours, I was looking for the next game that can hook me. And I think Horizon Zero Dawn is one of those where it's like in the distant future where our technology has been gone crazy with AI and stuff. And they're like robo, not dinosaurs, but uh, animals populating the world. And the hu humanity has fallen back into like Stone Age or a little bit later than Stone Age. And you have to unveil what has happened and why some people can use the technology they find and others cannot and stuff. And um, yeah, I don't. looks like from the main story, it does have a DLC as well, which is integrated on PC. Um, there is a progression uh, percentage on the stats page and it says now I'm at, at about 50%. So there's still more to come. And I enjoy playing it. I mean, the animations I've seen, like riding the horses. Uh, there are these robo horses, they're called striders. But the animations, uh, uh, totally all the animations that are done in this game are pretty on point. You would totally believe that these are moving like in the real world. It, it, it's crazy how, how good that looks. There was one the game. game. looked amazing. Yeah. The, I, I mean, I've um, seen it. 
it took a while until they ported it over from console to PC and looks like that the successor is also coming to PC pretty soonish. I think they have mentioned it in their um uh, for the shareholders, the, the new report, I think it was already listed there, which indicates that it should come soonish. I don't know when. But so the successor, uh, Horizon Forbidden West, is also heading to PC. And uh, it can only get better, right? <laughs> Normally those success successors um, do have some improvements, at least. If they are really better, we will see. But I have heard good things about uh, the successor. I haven't seen much of it yet. Because I'm PC player, gamer, not really console. Uh, the only console I have is a Nintendo Switch. And I don't know if that can be... It's a console, but it's not the typical console. Doesn't, doesn't the Steam Deck count? The Steam Deck? You mean uh, <laughs> one of these? <laughs> yeah, that. Well, uh, it's the consolidation or consolidification of a PC. So, yes and no. Uh, consoles, hardware-wise, are also, in the meantime, PCs, I guess. Yeah. But uh, what Valve has achieved there on the Steam Deck, they give you a mode that the PC boots into with their Steam UI that gives you a console feeling, but it's still a PC. Hmm. Hybrid thing. It's great, though. Ah. <laughs> and Horizon uh, Zero Dawn got a verified rating that means valve has tested it and it performs well graphical wise uh, the input with the gamepad works well so all everything can be achieved by co using the steam deck controls you don't have to nice. hook up a, um, a mouse or keyboard you don't have to use the touch screen i mean some games you have to use either the touch screen or hold the steam button and then operate the trackpad to get a mouse and there are some games that do need that for a launcher or so. And if that's happening, Valve might give them the unsupported rating because they say one of our criteria is it has to be operable or like steerable, controllable with the Steam Deck controls. Even though those games do still work. But I think a lot of people don't know that you can press the Steam button and get a mouse or you forget about that there is a touchscreen. I always forget about it. I, I'm always using the mouse by holding the Steam button and operating then the trackpad. But yeah, console, PC in console form with Steam Deck. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the other game I played was Stray, which got recently released where you play a little cat. That's also um, oh, yeah. in the far distant future. And also there the animations of the cat are adorable it's it's a cute oh, little game you can finish and then it the in the modding community got a hold of it and ruined everything <laughs> well there are mods right <laughs> i've seen some mods yes. where you can play as yes. garfield <laughs> i don't know what you've seen cypher i've seen very wholesome mods like play as uh, your pet <laughs> the the first one i saw was play as cj from san andreas so it was like it, it was it was it was nightmare fuel <laughs> yeah okay Thanks, twitter <laughs> I, I didn't see that the only thing i yeah, saw it, was um it was literally cj the human but like mashed into the cat uh, armature <laughs> so oh, it's gosh. like all deformed and like <laughs> trying to be cat-like and doing it's you just oh, I, don't dear. I don't have a link i don't have a link for you <laughs> <laughs> that's maybe for the better i didn't i didn't say for that the that was <laughs> <laughs> so i've only seen the uh, that you can play as the doom guy so where the cat has the helmet of the doom guy on and then you can oh, walk around there that's kind of funny and i i've seen a mod where you can play as a dog instead of a cat but i've not seen much more but still um the game is very uh it's not not frustrating because mm -hmm. You cannot fall off edges. I mean, cats apparently know how, where they can jump, even though we see on TikTok some cats that try to jump somewhere and fail miserably. <laughs> but uh, yeah, cats know where they can jump and the game offers you only to jump to the locations that you can reach and otherwise 
you can't go there, you won't fall off any edges. And that makes it very easy to steer and very comfortable and easy going. Still, I didn't expect this game to last that long. I thought it would be more like a cat simulator or so. But no, there, there's a story with it where you are going through like uh, three different areas, bigger areas, where you can complete tasks and then move on to the next area. And then there are even optional, collect uh, optional collectives. So stuff for memories that you can unlock or you help other um, inhabitants of those cities. And uh, yeah, in total, it's a cute little game. A cute little indie Did game. you complete it? Yeah, I completed it already. I can recommend yeah, it. Yeah, good things. I think the developers did a lot of cute interactions and some clever additions. Oh, yeah, I, so there I, is one. one I, I heard even... It, was the most anticipated game on Steam. It has the most wishlist entries, even more than like Starfield or other AAA titles. Wow. That was impressive. And uh, it got into my attention when I saw a tweet where they said uh, it's deck verified like two weeks before release. And I was like, okay, I want to have it. <laughs> I want to play it on the Steam Deck. And I did start and complete it on the Steam Deck and it works. Good. Now you, well have, enough. you have cats on the go, and that's all you need. You don't really need any other games now. Yeah, your, your you cats have, are going places. Stray and that's, that's oh. it. That's your life now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, so much gaming-wise from, from me. Um, we can go quickly that's over it. some Fever community news. So uh, one is a streamer.bot got updated yep. and is up up getting updates all the time but uh, currently it's at version 0 0.1.10 and i think the, the previous version was released at the anniversary of streamer.bot's first science releases and that's two years now that was the 16th of uh, june where it reached two years and mate. a lot of People have been using it. Yeah, it's all uh, thanks to the effort of it Nate, Nate the Great. It's growing as an incredible tool, and I, I'm, it's, it's amazing to see what, what's been done with it so far and where it's going. Yeah, for, for streamers, it's like uh, the one and only bot, and if you still have another bot, you either can replace it or you can uh, develop your own connection to it to, to use some mm -hmm. of the features it has. It's incredibly flexible, and if you haven't heard about that, uh, you might have been to TwitchCon, which has also happened just recently, uh, TwitchCon Amsterdam, that is, where uh, I have not been, but a lot of other people have been, also from our community, from the Fever community, and VRFLAT was even giving a talk on the streamer creation, uh, creators board there, how to use streamer.bot. Um, Alexander, if you're not familiar with Streamer.bot and some of our viewers who might not be as well, uh, it's it's basically a, a control suite that streamers can use to interconnect basically anything they want. Um, you can use C-sharp interfaces to interop with whatever APIs you can get your hands on. Um, it, it's been interrupted with a few um, extensions uh, on Twitch, like... <clears throat> Uh, the heat map extension which allows users to actually click on their screen and then mm. it sends that through and it, it'll process it and you can send off those commands to do whatever you like um and we, we've been encouraging a lot of developers to to look into like twitch integration and things like that because i mean we're streamers we love we love to have integration yeah. with all of our uh viewers and things too so um that's what streamerbot is it just kind of allows us to interconnect everything and it's been growing popular that's really cool is right. Heatmap like the most popular extension? Or uh, is Heatmap more? is just one of the one of the more recent ones that um, we've seen people using. Um, and at Lifesaver seventy four, um, one of the the leads of, of Fever um, does a little Mario on his screen that you can click on. If you click on it a hundred times, you'll gain a, a one up, and like mm -hmm. it, it, he jumps live to everyone's clicks. So every time anybody clicks on him, jumps up. Um, there's other other uh, add-ons like uh, was it crowd control? I think that do similar things to different games. Um, they mostly work kind of like emulated games, where they can like swap out um, sprite sheets and things like that. So 
you know, you pay in um, like Twitch bits, and then suddenly Mario is now a fish. <laughs> Just things like that. But uh, server bots like the super powerful version of, of whatever you want to do interconnectedly. And it's not only Twitch anymore. It's YouTube, Twitch, um, and I'm sure there's more APIs being worked on beyond that as as new streaming services pop up. Nice. Yeah, it's the one to go tool to use where you can, if you have the knowledge, it does have a little learning curve, but it's, uh, I, I'm, I was surprised to see people who have like no knowledge at all to, that were using streamer.bot and getting along with it, with the capabilities that it brings out of the box, like adding actions, sub actions, using them for their purposes, but you can, the flexibility with uh, writing your own C-sharp code within streamer.bot, that makes it like the most versatile tool ever. You can program every functionality that you need uh, yourself then. If, that, if not anybody else has done it yet, because in the meantime, there's even a big collection mm. of um, extensions of add-ons that people have developed, like uh, your own loyalty point system, where, you can, mm. where people can collect points by watching the stream, and uh, that's within streamer.bot. So yeah, it's... Uh, open open ended yeah it did reach two years and uh, vr flat was showing that on the creator tool showcase on the twitch amsterdam show and i think there will be a vod of that available at some point oh that would be great uh, i think yeah i think i saw that pop up somewhere uh, I, 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 if I'm not mistaken. right i've seen or heard something we'll, we'll that... have to find a link for that and post it on mm. the uh, on the VOD later right <laughs> Okay. Um... Yeah. Anyway, there's plenty of VR gaming news to talk about after we talk about all the Starcade Arcade things, I think. All right. <laughs> then let's dive in. Yes. Yeah, so, what's going uh, on at Starcade, Alexander? <laughs> so, Alexander is the CEO from Starcade Arcade. Uh, how, did, right. how did Starcade Arcade get funded, like get together, get created? How did it yeah. come? Starcade Arcade is 100% bootstrapped, but we've never taken an investor, never taken outside funding. Uh, all funding's just come from myself and my co-founder. He's the one, he introduced me to VR. Uh, I was working an engineering job. I worked for HP before I left and officially formed Starcade Arcade. And it was a it was a good career path. Like I can't say anything too bad about it because I think a lot of people would really enjoy the career that I had. Um, but one of the advantages of this role at HP was I would go out and I'd visit other companies and especially startups to go talk about like new technology and, and look for things to integrate. The more I saw of these startup communities and these entrepreneurs and their struggling lives, the more I wanted to be a part of that. <laughs> and then it was around that time that my best friend introduced me to VR. He had a set and he was like, hey, you need to check this out. I started playing it. I loved it. And kind of putting two and two together, I was like, you know what? I want to keep my technical skills sharp. Um, I was career wise, I was headed down this like project management managerial path, which again, that can be great for a lot of people. For me, I was like, I really like respect the technical co-founders and these startups that I see, and I want to stay super technical. So I just began VR as kind of a side project hobby, just learning it, just learning Unity while I made the first game for fun. And then it reached a point where I was like, no, nah, I want to do this full time. And so I started aggressively saving my money. I got like the smallest apartment that I could. And try to minimize <laughs> like my lifestyle as much as possible. Like I, I used to have a, a, like a big two bedroom apartment with like more furniture for no good reason <laughs> other than I had the money. And then I was like, nope, let's go like small one bedroom. Let's sell half the furniture. Let's cut down the lifestyle before I make this change. And then I started aggressively saving my money so that the day that I quit HP, I had enough like funding to sustain myself without ever taking from the company for like two years. And, you know, it was, it felt really good that, you know, when I told HP and I was very open about what I was planning on doing, I 
like my team at HP that, that worked for me, I, I had told them, I was like, all right, I'm not going to leave you for Dell or Microsoft, but I will leave you at some point to start my own company. So they knew it was coming. But even then, HP was like, you can't leave. Don't you need money to keep doing your VR stuff? And I was like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, that must have been feeling really good. Hear that. No. It felt really good. It definitely fly, felt little good. worms, fly. <laughs> yeah. So then at that point, I was free to, to exit and just work on my games full time. And then since I left HP, all of like all of Starcade Arcade's income. I've just put back into Starcade Arcade. So like we've had various contractors and other people come work for the studio and help build these games. And so I use the funds for that. And um, That's awesome. yeah, like it, it's been, it. it's been interesting. Um, I know a lot of people can look at the funded investment path and, you know, not necessarily anything wrong with that either, but bootstrapping has been kind of fun too. Wow. Just wow. I mean, yeah, I, I know in. a lot of people would have struggled with that, but uh, yeah. it looks really like you have planned that thoroughly and it looks I like it's working it out. I did plan it thoroughly. So in fact, like before I left HP with the good insurance and everything, I went to all three doctors, eye doctor, dentist, general doctor. And I said, give me a thorough examination. I need to know before I leave good insurance. Am I healthy? <laughs> Tell yeah. me. And they're like, you're pretty much in peak health. You, you look a little overworked and you should probably work less hours. And I was like, all right, we're not worried about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so, well, that's not going to happen. See you later. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll fix that. I'll join a startup. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. It's been good. Yeah. Once, uh, how big is a stock at Arcade by now then? Because you said uh, you have yeah. a co-funder. Uh, so you started it alone, but uh, it was successful. So we were able to expand, I guess. Kind of. I, we haven't reached the point of stabilization where we have like a lot of full time employees. I wish I just in good faith. I don't want to like promise something that I don't see like the stable income and funding for. So most of the studio has been like rotating contracts as we work through different parts of the game. Now, we've had some that have worked longer than others. Like we had two animators, 3D modelers that have done a ton of work for the studio and, and love working with them. Um, hopefully getting that to more a full-time point, even myself, I, you know, I'm just kind of open because I don't really mind telling people like even myself finding inspiration from like some of the shark tank entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was watching an episode where I think it was like Damien was, was talking about how, you know, he like bartended for years before even like he could be employed by his company so taking a note from that making sure to like extend the funds as long as possible i became a wedding dj on the weekends <laughs> which has been an interesting life choice but you know i just want to like work something a little bit extra on weekends and on nights that doesn't impact the studio mm -hmm. so uh, it's yeah brings me to your your uh social accounts yes i i was i was initially uh quite interested in speaking with you after seeing a few of your tiktoks uh initially when when you and uh, is that your co-founder also doing um just silly tiktok videos with that broken quest that you oh, absolutely yeah. tortured the ever living <laughs> garbage out of <laughs> oh my goodness that was amazing um watching just all that start to happen like how'd you just i so i want to ask like how'd you come up with all that stuff but that's the silly base question that everybody would ask um r really not like a bad question though I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm guessing most of your inspiration just came from development. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But really, where did where did the inspiration for all this come from? Because some of those are, are pretty on point. <laughs> sure, sure. There's a lot of things that we have tried. I think that's like the important thing to note because well before TikTok, there was a lot of I don't know if I'd call them PR stunts. That sounds a little crude, but like 
there's a lot of things that we tried to get visibility for our games, like some very unique, creative, offbeat ideas. Uh, like one random example was we paid a cosplayer to create a giant Slurpee worm outfit and, you know, try to make a video off of that. Just like random things. The list goes on of things that we've tried. Um, but TikTok ended up being like the most impactful for us. Well, that's and so once we saw that, it's a matter of like leaning into it, which is kind of the takeaway I'd give to any developer is when we started Starcade Arcade, um, actually Oculus set us up with like this free consultation call. I don't know if that's like a consolation prize for us not being on their store or I don't know what they're trying to do with that. <laughs> Let's assume they were trying to be altruistic, but they set up this consolation call and the marketing consultants, actually we had two calls. The first time when we first started, they kind of told us to do what other studios were doing or what they saw other studios successfully doing, which for them at the time, it was like discord service. We kept hearing, you know, build your Discord community, you know, look at what these developers have done with their Discord community. And we're just not very good at Discord. I mean, we love the people on our Discord and, you know, by it's, all means, difficult communicate message. with us. But like, it works better for some people than it did for us. <laughs> and, but that's what we were being told. We were being told, do Discord, do Discord. But then I tell you what, then like a year or two later, so we had a call with the same marketing people and they were like, keep doing TikTok. And then we talked to other developers and now they're telling those developers do TikTok because they see that it's worked for us. And kind of the takeaway from that for us and what I would want to share to other developers is I wouldn't listen too much or pay too much attention to like one thing that other studios are doing well and using as their marketing tool because it may not work for you. And there's right. a lot of things that didn't work for us TikTok just happened to. So we just started filming like some skits and then we were reusing the content on like Twitter and people seemed to resonate with that. And then as for like the actual content on it, you know, you start to pick up on what types of things do well for us. I could lump it into two categories. Anytime we criticize Meta or Oculus, those tend to do really well. I think because a lot of people aren't willing to do that. And we've probably put ourselves in app lab purgatory because of it. But it is something that people like appreciate seeing that candidness on social media about meta and their very shitty business practices towards indie developers. <laughs> That's a soundbite. That's going to show up <laughs> But it, whatever, it's true. And right. so that, that tends to resonate well. So we know if we post any content like that, it's probably going to, you know, mean something to somebody. And then the second one is the headset abuse. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So, I think it was like. Those are my favorites. VR doesn't work underwater. <laughs> they lied. <laughs> Yeah, that just kind of that's just evolved. And of course, it's like, you know, it's very silly. And for anybody who's like listening or, you know, watching, like what we're referring to is there are TikToks where we have this quest. It doesn't work anymore. I don't know if I'm breaking the illusion for somebody, but, you know, and then we just like film doing ridiculous things in it. I think, you know, I the first time we jumped into a pool was a big one because even I went to a conference lately and somebody went to introduce me and the person clearly didn't know who I was. And then the other person was like, he's the guy who jumped into the pool with the Oculus. And they're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> oh, he's that like, guy. Like, yeah. Oh, that guy. I guess, I like, guess that's right. me now. <laughs> yeah. I'll go with it. Um, but it is engaging. People find it entertaining. And like, the weird thing is, it's the only thing I could definitively say that correlates to game downloads. And so that's why we do it. Like, it's the only thing. Like, sure, uh, you know, talking with influencers and going to conventions, all of that's great. But like, analytically, the only thing I can definitively point to downloads is our TikToks. If a TikTok does well, we'll get downloads. It doesn't matter what that's it interesting. is. interesting. They can be the dumbest things and i try to warn people too that like talk to me and realize i'm a fully functioning human adult i'm like oh, our tiktok is 
of a lower age demographic and so will be the maturity of the content at points but like it does well and it actually helps the studio yeah that, that's also what we as creators uh, have more or less realized over the recent years you should not put everything into like one service uh, yes. try out more or less all of them and see what works so for some youtube shorts work well for others mm -hmm. tiktoks work well but don't put every effort you have into like one platform because even though you might be successful there even there might be happening something just reminds uh, reminding of a mixer where people have been successful and then it was shut down from one day to the other so yeah, yeah. put not all your bags into one uh, eggs into one basket yeah and i think you have to be smart too about like what type of community are you trying to cultivate i mean we definitely have different circles on the different social media platforms like most of our twitter community are going to be other developers and content mm -hmm. creators and like industry people which is great we need to stay connected with them for business but we're not going to get sales <laughs> from that you know and so like you just need to be aware for us the sales platform is tiktok and if that requires me jumping into a pool with the oculus headset on then so be it <laughs> <laughs> so i guess so um I, i've learned from uh, a couple of my or one particular friend of mine uh, who's a word is escaping me right now like we're doing right now interviews people um always find some some kind of offbeat question to ask and i think i've just thought of mine oh i'm ready for how, it how bad does that headset smell <laughs> <laughs> That is an offbeat question. <laughs> um, it, it's been through a lot, but, you know, it doesn't smell as bad as you think because it's constantly rinsed off in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> so it mostly just smells like chlorine and burnt it, electronics. It mostly <laughs> smells like bleached chlorine. All right. um, because, yeah, we've put barbecue sauce and we've put all yeah. kinds of things on it. And there's... You know, I now have trigger reactions to certain sauces due to our TikToks. <laughs> I, oh, no. I don't look at barbecue oh, sauce no. the same way after since our <laughs> Sweet Baby Ray's video. But oh, Sweet Baby Ray's is the best. <laughs> the sauce is the best. The, the headset itself is relatively clean. I'm looking at it now. It's, it's pretty clean just because it gets rinsed off in the pool frequently. <laughs> So I had I, I don't know I had to think of something to ask about the headset that just nobody else would think to ask it. That's yeah. why I to it, ask for yeah. it. we have one question from chat though. Uh, oh, let's hear yeah, it. if Starcade Arcade is uh, how well are you doing for yourself as an indie VR developer? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think it depends on how you look at it. Um, if I look at it as a studio, there's a lot of successes. And I'm not trying to dodge a question. I'm just being realistic. So like first we, we released three games, Star Blazer, Virus Popper, Space Slurpees. First game, Boy. Star Blazer was mostly a flop. I would say if you look at it commercially, like I sunk a lot of money into it that didn't get back. At the same time, I learned a lot and you can't put any kind of price tag on learning. I mean, I literally started Star Blazer when I started learning Unity. So there's a lot of learnings from there. And that was kind of our introduction into what is game development? What is VR? What's the community? And people knew us from that. So that's good in itself. Second game, Virus Popper, we released for free. So you can't make a lot of money off of a free game. But it did get a lot of popularity. Today, tens of thousands of downloads that really helped us make a name for ourselves. Most especially, it got us introduced to HTC. Like... We went from, I mean, of course, we were on their store of uh, Viveport, but like when we released Virus Popper, we actually got a call and HTC was like, this is brilliant. Who made this? We just want to meet the devs. And that introduction has carried us very far into releasing on other right. HTC headsets with our third game. So then Space Slurpees, I mean, as a developer, you always want more, but objectively speaking, Space Slurpees is cash flow positive, meaning we have made more money on Space Slurpees than it took to develop it. 
Um, and that's great. That's a metric that actually a lot of games can't achieve and I'm very happy with. Now, on the flip side, again, just speaking very realistically, because I just, you know, <laughs> I think it's good for people to know it can be hard to be in game development. Oh, just, As I mentioned, just, all that money that we made, I did put back into the studio. So there are people that got paid to work on Starcade Arcade. In total, we've employed like over 40 people across different contracts, you know, maybe small things like localization, maybe big things like the animators, modelers that we had working out of our studio for like almost a year. Um, and that's fantastic, right? And they walked away with paycheck. Alexander, myself, did not walk away with a paycheck. I've still not taken any money out of the studio. So if you're wondering if I'm living a, a rich and luxurious life, no, I'm not. Um, that, that's why I'm a wedding DJ on the weekends. And uh, my girlfriend's the, the money bags. <laughs> she, she supports me with a few meals. And but that's just also like entrepreneurial life, right? Like um, I remember I went to a game convention. I guess it was like Oculus Connect a couple of years ago. And there was a very animated argument where somebody was trying to say I was an entrepreneur. At the time, I was working at HP. I hadn't fully started the studio. And I was like, no, if I'm taking a full-time salary from somebody, then I haven't fully stepped off the ledge. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be a harsh critic to myself. I, I, I would be joking to call myself that. But now, like, I'll happily use the term because... I, you know, when you're just trying to make money wherever you can to support your dreams, I think that puts you in the entrepreneurial group, but it's yeah. not easy. And skateboarding without the corporate net. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, game development. So hopefully that kind of answers the question. It sounds good to me. Um, yeah, I can't imagine game development is like the, the master discipline. I mean, you, you have to create something that works. So you need to be able to program. To, to do software development. You need something that looks good. You need something that has good audio. And then it should make fun as well. So if that's not the most tricky thing to do, I don't know. And uh, being successful with that is one of the best things that can happen to you. So I'm, yeah. I'm very glad to hear that Space Lurpies, um did pay off. How did you yeah. come up with the idea of the game? That, that's a fun one. One of the things we were doing to try to promote our games was go to game conventions, right? Makes sense. Um, and one of the ones we had been to was G-Star in South Korea. This is South Korea's biggest game convention. Now, it was an incredibly fun experience. Loved going. We were actually like the first American indie company to show there or something crazy like that. <laughs> and it was very fun. But one major oversight. We don't speak Korean. Okay. You wouldn't think that would be that big of a deal, but it is, um, especially <laughs> in Korea. I think there was a number of people that even if they could speak English, it's intimidating. Um, and so what we saw, we, we see crowds of people walk around our booth. Um, and if some people were brave enough to come over and talk to the Americans with the VR headset, then it was a little bit of a disaster because the, f the game we were showing at the time was Star Blazer, real-time strategy game in VR, which requires some instructions. Like, just let's be honest, real-time strategy is a difficult <laughs> genre as it is, and then in VR, and if most of your users haven't used VR, this requires some hand-holding. Uh, it is very frustrating for us because Ooh. this is no fault to the people that came to our booth. In fact, I'm glad that they did, right? They're, they were the brave ones. But then once they were there, we had the hardest time teaching them how to play our game. Um, and it was very frustrating and disappointing as a developer because, you know, you want people to just enjoy your game. And so it was in discussion, like, if we don't speak the language, how do we make a game that anybody could pick up and play? And this is where the idea of Space Slurpees came is because it's meant to be ridiculously intuitive. Mm -hmm. For those of you know, uh, who aren't familiar with the game, like it's snake in VR, but to explain it even further, you have a space snake on your hand, wherever you move the controller, the snake moves with you. It's that simple. It'll get longer as you eat food. You don't want to hit yourself. You don't want to hit other snakes. 
Um, the physical action is similar to imagine I was holding a really long flag or like a, a long sock underwater. And that's kind of the feeling you get that if it, it just follows wherever your hand goes, it's meant to be chill, relaxing, but it's meant to be something that physically and intuitively you just understand when you pick it up. Mm. And I think that's why it's done so well is we just wanted something that's easy to play. And when we talk to a company like HTC and, you know, we, we were a launch partner on their last two headsets, which is insane because again, we're nobodies <laughs> for the most part. I mean, we, we've made somewhat of a name for ourselves in the VR community, but at the same time, you know, I just told you about how hard it is as an indie studio so to be a launch partner with HTC on the last two headsets is amazing. But they looked at the game and they were like, it's simple. Anybody can play it. And that in itself has a lot of appeal, especially in VR, where people are trying to learn a new medium and you know interact with a new device that nobody's ever seen or interacted with before. Well, I do Easy think to that learn. you at least earned yourself within the scope of the small quote unquote small worldwide VR community meme legend uh, with some of those TikToks. So I'm, yeah. I'm granting you that title. <laughs> I'll take it. Like I said, the guy who jumped to the pool with the Oculus Quest. The I'll guy who it. jumped to the pool with the Oculus <laughs> Quest and poured barbecue sauce all over it. All right. Yes. That I've not seen yet. I just saw the jump in the pool. <laughs> it doesn't work. They lied. <laughs> there are many. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, easy to learn, uh, also hard to master. Will it uh, become more difficultly later? I, I've just seen, I haven't played it myself, to, uh, to be ashamed. Uh, I, I don't know, would it work with Proton? <laughs> because I'm the guy who plays all the games on Linux. And uh, mm. if the game doesn't work yeah. with Proton, uh, if there is no native Linux version, then it's a little bit tricky for us to play it. Because technically there is a hurdle. Um, yeah. yeah, will it become later? Because we know that also the concept of easy to learn, hard to master is very successful as well. So is there um, like a progression? Yeah. There is. Um, if you play through like the solo maps, it gets harder. Your enemies go from like, there's little things that pop up as obstacles. At first, they're just static and in place. You know, these little jazzroids is what we call them angry asteroid characters um but then they get progressively harder they start chasing you they start becoming mm -hmm. like vampiric asteroids and then they start riding Tricks. dragons oh. and, and flying at oh. you so there's challenges from the maps themselves but then i think even more of a challenge is once you move into multiplayer mm. because at first when you're playing with your friends you'll realize that you control the speed. So if you just very slowly, casually want to collect food with your worm, you can. Um, but in multiplayer, when it starts to become competitive, I mean, you control your speed. And so you get people that are, yeah, they can be moving really <laughs> fast. And oh, you're the game. trying to sabotage the other players while also not run into them or run into yourself. And so those can become quite frantic, to be honest. Uh -huh. So it can turn into a workout, I see. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> oh, nice. C competitive ribbon dancing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Ribbon it's, dancing. It's basically competitive That's the ribbon term dancing. I was looking for, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, um, the previous game, Star Blazer, that was a real-time strategy game in VR. Yes. That's got a, a, big, uh, a big graphical update a couple months ago, didn't it? Yeah, actually one in progress. Um, we have a big release. We're re-releasing it and we're bringing it to mobile VR for the first time. So it is drastically different than when we released it the first time. I mean, the concept's still there, like the different ships, their, their types. Um, there's kind of like a little bit of a kind of a rock, paper, scissors between some of the ship types and, and the units. Those are still there, but when we re-release it, we have two new factions to play as, and you, you have a lot more features that I think our StarCraft fans were asking for. So, for instance, things that are innate to StarCraft, such as like queuing up in the builder, 
uh, some resources. So you got drones collecting resources during battle. A lot of those things that you kind of expect to see in an RTS, we're integrating in as well as really improving the design of the maps to make it more competitive. Um, just because we've learned a lot. <laughs> I've learned a lot about VR and development since we released it the first time. And so we are doing it. We're giving a big overhaul. We'll hit the PC platforms with the update, Steam and all that. Everybody's going to get the update, you know, no problem. Uh, but then also it'll be the first time that it's released on mobile VR. So we'll put it on Quest and Pico and all that. Excellent. Is it a uh, when it's done timeline or do you have a uh, hard date? That you're shooting We're for? shooting for end of summer, a which is coming up. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting pretty close. <laughs> yeah, getting pretty close. So lo- loose deadline. But that's kind of what we've been saying. I think it's pretty close. It's feeling good. Yeah, but as you mentioned before, um, <clears throat> Space Lurpees was so successful because it was so easy to learn. You just pick up a controller and you intuitively kind of know what you have to do. Uh, how did you come up with the first game, Starblazer, then, when it's so difficult to, to learn? I mean, so real-time so strategy... Yeah, even even the the like StarCraft or so, those are especially multiplayer. Is you, you need to learn that there's a learning curve, and Absolutely. then getting. Are you a big RTS game fan, or how did that come up? I love strategy games, and so mm. definitely, I think you stumbled upon the answer. Is it's a passion project? Yeah. Okay. Like when I started in VR, you know, I mentioned that. Part of the reason I started was just purely out of passion of wanting to create in VR. And so when I asked the question like, well, what doesn't exist in VR that I would want to play? Well, you know, five years ago, there definitely yeah. wasn't any space RTS games. Mm-hmm. Five years later, I now understand why. <laughs> because <laughs> it's extremely complex to build in VR and to get users to understand it intuitively. Now, I think I've learned a lot and even taking some of what we've learned from Virus Popper and Space Slurpees and bringing that back into Star Blazer and how to make something more intuitive. So my goal is if I can take something as complex as an RTS game, but make it simple enough that, you know, one of my Space Slurpees players can also play Star Blazer, then I've really achieved something. So something that we've done for this re-release is really thought about how do we simplify the game not simplify as in like i'm not dumbing it down because it's a strategy game right you don't want to do that but kind of that's easy to learn difficult to master i'm um, like there's a board game of i'm obsessed with called carcassonne mm-hmm. very simple rules but the more you get into it the more you realize how complex your strategy can be and ideally that's the type of strategy game i'd want to make and so there's a lot of things that we've done um things that will help the player like automation of the ships better pathfinding for the ships better selection you know easier menu navigation just making it easier to play but still giving them the full capacity to strategize and go to town with that cool yeah that's always probably the best way to go uh, and to get into a new field out of passion and mm-hmm. yes, I haven't heard about, I mean, the, the most classic games that we know in VR are either rhythm games, where mm-hmm. you move your body to the rhythm in kind of different mm-hmm. ways and shapes, etc. And probably some kind of a shooter. Yeah. Uh, and, and the full, full body stabbing games. Yeah. Which is yeah. full body. Yeah. Full, full body murder simulators. That's kind of yeah. what they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, there are not that many strategy games. That's true. I, I think no, there's... No. Uh, uh, three? I can think of three. Yeah. There's, I think... Uh, the Humans and... Um, what was Cat Lateral Damage? Final, uh, Final Assault was a big one. They're like World War II yeah, themed, which just yep. personally doesn't uh-huh. appeal to me aesthetically, but great development studio and tight mechanics. Uh, I know the only like strategy game on official quest store I could think of is Eternal Starlight. And then there's another one. There's like Battle. Oh, I'm forgetting. There's, there's a pretty cool one that's like first person view within inside of a ship. 
like Battlestar. Uh, I don't remember. I, I heard about it. Yes, I, I I think I know what you which game you mean. Yeah, and you know what's funny is like I don't even mind like talking about them because I don't see it as very. I mean, we're all doing different things. So, oh, Battle Group VR. I mm, think they've right. got some cool mechanics. I support them for sure. I think it's great. I think we all offer different things. Yeah. Um, if you want to be like inside of a ship as a commander managing your fleet, then like Battle Group VR, go for it. Mm. Our game really is attempt, like, we want to appeal to fans of StarCraft. Like, I think everybody would agree there's no game, there's no StarCraft VR. And so that's the void we're attempting to fill. <laughs> Don't tell Don't Blizzard. Tell Blizzard. <laughs> yeah. Don't give if them somebody ideas. Asked me about the acquisition, if it was like a bad thing, I was like, well, a bad thing for the gaming community, a good thing for the game development community, because now everything's going to be so slow. I don't have to worry about a StarCraft VR coming out. <laughs> well, no, not for another 30 years at least. <laughs> yeah. And Microsoft's VR strategy is lacking to say the least. So that, that concern VR went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, does HTC continue to have a VR strategy? Hmm. So from, um, as, you, as you mentioned, you had a good connection to HTC and, and their headsets. Um, from where you make the most like revenue and stuff, where are your games doing best from... From the stores we know, I mean, there's Oculus, there's with their own store, and I think it's a little bit sad that the games they are good games on all of those stores, but exclusive, and then you can't play them because you're not going to buy a second VR headset, really. I mean, some yeah. crazy people do, but most of the people will just have one, so they either go with the Meta VR headsets nowadays, or with an HTC headset or a PC headset. I mean, most of them do work also on PC in some regard, but with the exclusive stores, yeah. You, from what I get, you are available on all the stores with your games. Yeah, pretty much. Like Space Slurpees, in addition to being in several arcade fronts, uh, it's on. Pico, it was on the HTC Focus as well as the HTC, um, the, the most recent device. And then it was on, of course, it's on Oculus App Lab. It's even on Nolo VR, Biofort for PC, Steam for PC, and yeah, HTC Flow. That was the name that <laughs> escaped me yeah. for a second. It was on the Flow. It's on a, it's on a lot of headsets. Um, yeah, where, where I, does it do best? Yeah, uh, I will. I have to be, you know, I have to be careful how I answer that question. Not because I care. I actually don't mind like oh. sharing numbers and things like mm. that. But there's certain like okay. contractual okay. obligations. But okay. but it's okay. I have a good answer. One, I will tell you, App Lab is not our best performing, and hope I don't care if they get mad at me saying that because they want the perception that they're the lead headset store. And App Lab hides your games. You're very familiar with that. So I'm not going to pretend like it's our best performing. It's not. Um, and actually, so leading into that, I would say regionally, our best performing region right now is China and Asia. And we spend a lot of time focused on the international market. And part of the reason I want to say that is I want to encourage developers like there is a world outside of the West. And while Meta wants to convince you that they're the leaders and you could argue that they're the leaders in the West. Keep in mind, there's a lot of markets outside of the West. And so for us, most of our income comes outside of the domestic United States. Um, of course, there's still a market there. Of course, you want to you know, work on that and be successful there. Mm. But international markets huge for us. A lot of our partnerships are the international ones. They do well there. I would say there's equal opportunity in terms of uh promotion and advertising of your app on their stores uh, which can be a good thing for indie developers such as ourselves and so that that's done well for us so devs localize your games start talking to china companies mm -hmm. yeah we heard that from steam i mean steam was opening to the china market and it was mm -hmm. a huge boom and a lot of developers started to localize for the Chinese market and it was very successful, even though it's pretty much regulated. 
you have to be careful what you release in what form yeah. etc but i mean space lurpees probably won't have an issue <laughs> with getting regulated or so so yeah that's should, good to hear which it, device was the most difficult to get everything ported over to most difficult uh so none, none of them are particularly easy but uh, yeah, I would I'll I'll say any of the ones that if they're not using the Unity XR toolkit and most are moving that way, but if they're not, then that's going to make it more difficult for sure because if it uses XR toolkit, if it uses Open XR, then it's a super easy port for the most part. Um but anybody uses that uses their own native SDK is going to be a hard time. So I guess that's also advice for devs is if you're looking at it, the first question I ask is, are you using Unity's XR toolkit? And if the answer is no, then you might want to ask yourself if it's worth it. <laughs> bye bye. It might be. <laughs> Can't, not saying I, that it's not, but yeah, it's going to be I, more difficult. Yeah, okay. I jumped on that bandwagon uh, real early. So I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So in fact, the uh, effort you have to put into porting your games to all the stores, all the uh, headsets is like covered by Unity and the XR tools? It helps a lot. <laughs> but there are still <laughs> platform specific things you have to put effort into. Definitely. In fact, yeah, yeah, Cypher and I were joking about how the first couple of days of porting is just expecting to see a black screen in your headset. By now, it's routine. I know that's how it's going to go, so it doesn't freak me out. <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, why isn't this working? Log cat, log cat, log cat. <laughs> yeah. How well no is it doing? No exception. How well is it everything doing on Steam? Because I mean, for us PC gamers, I think Steam is the most important platform. But how is the perception from your side? Yeah, Steam is definitely important. I mean, Steam gets a lot of criticism for being filled with less curated titles. But after going through, you know, everything with meta, you know, I applaud Steam for at least giving equal opportunity to everybody. Yes, mm. you can get drowned out in the noise. Um, but honestly, like some of that's that just puts the uh, the responsibility on the developer. What I mean is like, Star Blazer, when it was first released, it was mostly a flop. I'm not going to blame Steam for that. The truth is, our release was like, there's a lot of things that would change. So we did terribly. Like, we released the day before Christmas. Horrible decision. Like, <laughs> and okay. like, we didn't give enough time for people to wish list and like, we didn't promote it. And I, you know, we definitely, when we were released, had performance issues because this was like years ago and many learnings ago. And like, yeah, honestly, when you when you do that, you deserve to be buried. <laughs> That's just mm -hmm. part of the learning, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you come out with something that is quality and is accessible, then I think you stand a better chance of resonating and can, can rise to the top. Like Virus Popper, as an example, um, this was well before even App Lab or anything like that. And so its popularity came from Steam. And so one of the biggest propellers for our studio and promoters is directly tied to Steam. Now, again, that's a free game, so it's not like we made a ton of money, but that visibility is huge. That's what helped us get a Discord community. That's what helped us get some of those industry contacts and leads. And I even asked some of these companies that we partnered with, I was like, what made you want to reach out to us? And they said, well, virus poppers in the top, you know, 10 or whatever it was for like that week on Steam VR games. That's how they found us. And Steam and Valve gave us that opportunity just because people tried it, people liked it, and it kind of got self-promoted within the app. Um, and of course now, and then I, that really, that popularity from virus popper is honestly what helped the release of Space Slurpees in a lot of ways. So yeah. it's interesting when you like connect the dots of everything. Right, right. And that's, I think, where Steam is still one of the strongest um, market leader is with its community, with the gaming community. Mm -hmm. 
because it does have the interaction with the you can invite friends to your games very easily through steam where i don't know how it works on on the other platforms probably there's a way too but connecting players i think there steam is still the leading platform with forums with um their recommendation system even though of course it can be abused but that can always be the case uh, so we know that for example epic didn't go with any kind of community integration there are no recommendations because they're like yeah if, if too, pe too many people are saying this game is shit we don't want to know <laughs> we still want to sell it okay. while on, yeah. on steam oh, it yeah. can happen and uh, on the other hand if there is like a bad decision from or not a bad decision directly but if the community is like not liking the decision that has been made then they are review bombing it which of course is the kind of abuse because the game still can be great it's just their way to express express their frustration and epic totally skipped that part and they don't just right. don't have that but i think i think that with that you also have the chance to get that kind of visibility you mentioned yeah definitely it steam is much more democratic which I've come to appreciate a lot. <laughs> right on. Democratic as in not political affiliation. I mean, like democratic yeah. as in it's it's open. It's, you know, like you said, it's driven by community and by people. And I think it's more fair in that sense. And regarding that part with the recommendations or the Steam reviews, can you see... Um, a relation to the Steam reviews and sales for like oh yeah I, I think in a lot of the metrics are known it's like there's different there's different milestones it's like 10 reviews and then 50 reviews and then I, you know, I forget the metrics my community manager mostly pays attention to that but I know there's definitely like different milestones and it's uh it builds and and the more that it's there the more it pushes and promotes which i think is great <laughs> again i think it's it's fair and yeah. i don't feel bad if we're sinking underneath the steam masses that tells me i just need to work harder <laughs> <laughs> and that also relates probably with the wish lists then so the more wish list entries oh, yeah. you have and if they definitely last week or so important. There had been so everybody the... should wishlist Saberpunks, Cypher's game that he's working on. Go uh -huh, wishlist it. Because uh -huh. it does help. It's done already. I also have I, I just realized I have Slurpees on my on my wish list. <laughs> I, I should get it from Lee. Hey, Thanks. I have space Slurpees behind me, in fact. He's in it. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I need to get it. But I'm also interested in uh Star Blazer because uh, reg um, strategy game in VR. That's uh, still missing from my list of pile uh, my pile of games it is we'll actually, keep an eye on it we got that big release coming i was thinking on and, this and uh i believe someone actually approached me when you guys were looking for someone to map the star blazer theme oh I th yeah in beat saber i think oh. yeah someone actually approached me about that and i i listened to the song and i was like this is a cool song but it's it's just way too repetitive for a beat saber map <laughs> Like it, it's cool. I like the theme song. Yeah, that, that just, goes back it just to just would have gone too long for a map. <laughs> that's fair. I think so. We did, Joe. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we did end up having somebody map it, and that goes back to like our marketing strategies. I mentioned we tried a lot of things. That was one of them. Is mm -hmm. my co-founder, community manager, suggested he was like, let's get all of our songs mapped to beat saber songs you know it's just more like visibility and mm. you know things that we tried because actually all of our music is 100 percent custom <laughs> ah perfect that was my next question would it be possible yes. to have those on stream without getting strikes but you answered yes. that already. yeah so this is the story of we how we accidentally became a record label yes so ah. when we first released star blazer the composer asked if he could retain the rights to put on Apple Music and Spotify. And actually, I didn't care. I'm a huge supporter of the artists that we work with. I want them to, you know, gain equal opportunity and, you know, visibility from the work that they do. So I was like, yeah, go for it. I don't care. I'm about the games. I'm not about like taking money from the music. 
But then we started getting the copyright strikes. And, you know, people started streaming Star Blazer. They were getting yeah. strikes on YouTube and yeah. Twitch. And we realized, oh, it's because the soundtrack is up. And so then began a process of regaining those rights. And then all the music that we created after that, we own as well. So like literally, if you go to Spotify, you can find Starcade Arcade. It's all the music from all of our games. We don't use anything licensed or anything pre-made. We only custom music. And then we just white label it for all streaming so that you don't get any strikes on Twitch or YouTube. Cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that. So go, go, map it, go map it in all the games if you're out there watching because you can do that. Yeah, <laughs> you, you absolutely can. <laughs> There's some fun songs for sure. Yeah, there, there really are. I was listening to some just before the, uh, the vodcast before we got you on. Actually, I'm like, okay, let's review. Oh, yeah, this is nice. good. This is good. I was bopping along. To, there's a couple of nice, nice boppy songs in there. Definitely. One, so just the, uh, I think it was the Starcade Arcade theme. I was saying we, we need to lay that in like right after our intro for the vodcast, I think. If, if oh, I love the theme. Very retro. <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, what I'm also. Sorry, so an artist that's contracted in, or uh, that was like who, who created that music? Yeah, so we work with, if you look, it all says by Starcade Arcade, and then it says like featuring. And then the featured artist is the one who wrote the song. And so, gotcha. again, I want to make sure that they get the credit and the visibility. You see pretty much every game has a song by Chalk Dinosaur. That guy and his music, he's incredible. He's a great musician. We love working with him. He, I guess, likes working with us. And so we just pretty much always ask him to make a song for us. Um, and then there's a few others that you see on there that we've worked with as well. James Joshua mm -hmm. Otto does like more of our instrumental music and very talented. Um, so for the most part, they write that we give like direction. I usually have like a Spotify playlist of five songs be like, all right, this track needs to have this type of feel and, and theme. You, the Star Arc you do your match. <laughs> yeah. The Starcade Arcade theme song, believe it or not, I wrote the lyrics to unintentionally. I was like, I kind of like, wrote down what i thought it should say and then i was like do your magic and then he came back and like he had literally made this whole song around the lyrics and i was like no no you could have changed those and he's like nah, i like them that's awesome like, okay, okay. Yeah, there so that's kind of fun that, i think that's the last song i was listening to just before he came on too so yeah yeah no he like Good almost stuff. verbatim <laughs> took the lyrics for that one i was like all right well it sounds amazing so cool <laughs> Um, I, I would have one more Top question. Banger went. <laughs> and uh, what I, I'm always like remembering the first Steam Dev Days when Valve was approaching developers or like uh, suggesting developers to get the community more on board of their games by letting the community create content for your game. That is like mm. being open for modding, modding tools, and maybe integrating that in, into games. Is that something you've been thinking about? Or is that already a thing for your games? It's not a thing for our games, but I would love for it to be. In fact, one of the things that I firmly believe and hoped at some point I can utilize is that if big games only paid attention to what people are modding, then they would know what features to develop like and i and i think there has to be a way to like even integrate what people are doing like i see no reason why a big game development studio shouldn't hire a modder like even a short-term project i'm sure they have their own thing that they want to do but like pay them like why did beat studios not reach out to some of the people modding their game and just say like okay here's a few thousand dollars. We're going to integrate your mod work for us for like a month to, to make it kosher. Like, Corbin, hold me back. Hold me back, Corbin. Hold, I mean, me trust me, if I had the you, money, you're going to be rich. modifying <laughs> star blazer, I would just be like, okay, here's a wad of cash. Make your slurpy mod work in the game. And like, you know, come out to our studio for a month. I would love to do that. Like, okay. and I, the only reason I think, you know, sometimes you can't do that is if there's a copyright thing, like, okay, if somebody mm -hmm. takes Age of Empires and then puts a Star Wars mod on it, okay, 
obviously, you know, you can't make that kosher, but like there's so much goodness out there in terms of mods that's underutilized. There's just a ton obviously, of obviously BC was a good one to pick on. <laughs> yeah. As especially of all of the I mean, we're like in this new uh I would call it like the VR Renaissance kind of where we've got all of these new companies up and coming like yourself uh the company that i'm working for uh the like beat games they kind of went woo, flew past everybody um yeah. but like just all of the the smaller community developers and the opportunities that we all have to just harbor that community and show what kind of crazy integrations we can kind of like poke at each other for our games and things like that because like i'm I, I'm personally a big fan of dropping weird, goofy development Easter eggs in games, but at the same time, making sure that it's somehow at least relevant to the game itself, the community, and some of your friend developers too. You know, so you've got those in jokes, you've got those out jokes, and then you've got a bunch of silly Easter eggs that people can enjoy. Yeah, and I, I think you know, I would love to see more collabs and things like that. Like I remember, I don't know, a few years ago, we reached out to the O Shape guys and we're like, "Hey, let's collab. Let's put our, you know, music in your game." And they're like, "Oh, we don't have time." No, okay. they did do collabs <laughs> already with like synth writers and stuff. <laughs> so hey, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, miss, missed opportunity, absolutely missed right? opportunity. But so, you know, but hopefully in the will... future, do more collabs and things like that because I think it's great. You know, yeah, maybe we can see a, a Saber Punk's. Uh... A slurpy stage. Who knows? Yeah. There we go. That'd be awesome. We'll, we'll hand over, give you some assets. Absolutely. Let's do it. It's cool. You want that? All right. Do you, serious, do, you, talk. <laughs> do you have uh, already, I mean, you have now three games out. And even though you said you are working on updates, for example, for uh, Star Blazer, uh, do you have another game already in the work? In the works? Always. Yeah. Always. Okay. Good. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Anything you so can talk the, about? The strategy is like yes. twofold. You know, I'd say like we don't ever want to release a sequel. We'd rather keep the titles updated. So even like I mentioned, Star Blazer, pretty much failed release. You know, if I'm to be hard on myself, um, a lot of goodness out of it. But you know, obviously not a huge commercial success. But not giving up on it. We're gonna keep updating it. Keep it fresh. I'm not going to release a second RTS game. Like we call this company Starcade Arcade because I'd rather each title hit a different genre. So what I can pretty much guarantee is we're not going to release a sequel. We're going to try our best to keep content updated. Um, depends on my caffeine intake, but I'm definitely trying, right? And then each That's game awesome. should be a new genre. And so okay. the new titles will hit different genres. I probably won't go for the rhythm genre. That's a little oversaturated, but definitely some of the others are interesting. Yeah, cool. Yeah, a little bit. Looking forward to your space game. I'm a big yeah. space Although game I, fan. I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount rhythm mechanics being tossed into other genres, though. There's some, definitely. Some different well, and I think we kind of hit that with like Virus Popper because it is a rail game. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're There's not smashing drums or anything like that, but like for sure, you can get into a rhythm of popping these viruses. <laughs> I was, I had a lot of fun with it on stream a few months ago. So I went, went through and got all of the, all the golds. Yeah, went got all the golds. It's wacky, but it's fun. <laughs> um, so we we all know about the pandemic that has hit us all. More or less hard Wait, over the last what? two or three years. Yeah, yeah, you understood me. <laughs> How did that affect Starcade Arcade? I mean, game development, you said you don't, you are reaching out to other contractors. So I guess most of it can be done remote. But also, mm -hmm. like, uh, did you see something? So, work wise is one question. And the other question is, like, did it affect sales, sales maybe even? Because more people are now at home. We know that, for example, the HTC Vive, uh, not the HTC Vive, the Vive Index headset was sold out for a while because a lot of people stayed at home and yeah. got into VR. Did that also reflect uh, for Starcade Arcade? Oh, massively. Um, oh. I mean, we have a game called Virus Popper, right? Yeah, Which okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it, it massively. But to give you a little bit more background on that story, 
we were working on Starblazer. It was in early access. And so we're getting closer to, you know, putting the stamp of full, you know, fully fledged finished game on it. And we'd been traveling to conventions, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. One of the conventions we were trying to attend was Taipei Game Show. Taipei Game Show took place the exact week that the CDC declared COVID a pandemic and, you know, a world emergency. So we were on the flight to Taiwan when the convention got canceled. We would then get quarantined right after that. Uh. Our work was like, don't come back. (laughs) And... Uh, you know, then the world kind of went into a state of panic. And at that time, information was thin and it was uh, very scary, for lack of a better yeah. term, especially for people yeah. of like younger ages. I mean, you just get like all kinds of messages. And, you know, my co and I were talking, we we're like, is there anything we can do to help? Like, and then we're thinking, well, we make games. And then we're like, we make games. And so we kind of had this idea of like, (laughs) maybe we should try to make a game that's just like, even that the very first idea was before you start playing, you have to wash your hands for 20 seconds, which is literally what you have to do in virus popper. Um, Because, you know, that concept was very new where we're talking like very beginning of the pandemic. And so we're like, well, do we want to take away time from star blazer and, and my co-founder goes, OK, well, why don't you like make a little demo? Like, I'll give you a day, <laughs> you know, like just just go play with it. See what you come up with. And I was like, I have an idea. And it's like, OK, go with it for a day. So that night I chugged like three Red Bulls. I stayed up all night and I made this, you know, rail game where you got these viruses coming at you and you pop them with the disinfectants. I sent it over to my co-founder. He played. He's like we're doing this. <laughs> and so within two oh, weeks, Chris. we released virus popper. Like we got on the phone with contractors. Like, can you make a song in a week? All right. <laughs> like, let's do this. And worked on the we whole need game. Trey and Matt Smith on this music. <laughs> yeah. And we, we, we got it released an insane amount of time, which was good because, uh, you know, just a few weeks after we had released, they started putting like restrictions in place because Mm -hmm. I mean, our game was meant to be positive and semi informative. uh, And it actually achieved that. Like I literally had schools tell me they used our game trailer as a PSA for their students because the CDC content was too threatening and negative. I mean, not, not to diss the CDC, obviously, you know, important information but like not very digestible for younger audiences but our game trailer was and so they're literally using that in schools which is crazy to me um and so that that felt good but some other content was not necessarily in good taste and like let's be honest people were dying like you know you don't want you don't want to treat the subject poorly and so a lot of game companies um and platforms started banning anything virus related which Uh is a good call but also you know i have to admit i'm a little bit happy we got ours in before those bans went into place so we're the only like official virus game (laughs) that was released for vr okay (laughs) interesting (laughs) story though yeah it was just weird i'm not trying to say i'm taking advantage of the situation but it did help us in terms of visibility that's just the truth of it so we, we have we have two things that are virus related related that came from the pandemic. We have we have virus popper, which was directly related from the pandemic. And if you if you look at Corbin's hat there, fever, F E V R I mean fever, pandemic. I don't I don't know what we were thinking, but we formed up <laughs> the VR group fever. All right. Yeah. Yeah. What? yeah, okay. <laughs> there was one other game that gained in popularity due to the pandemic and that was plague inc evolved where they edit oh, yeah, um, right. where you were also an infection that had to spread over the world and you had the, one of the goals was to infect the world but they made also an add-on that was for free until the pandemic is solved i, I think it's still free that was called the cure where you had mm. to do the opposite thing and that game yeah. gained also a lot of popularity because people wanted to 
learn about those things, get some information, but not the dry way from like reading stuff, but the entertaining way. So I think yeah. there's nothing wrong with uh, having a game that is tackling that topic. That's totally fine. I think it's a great way to convey, you know, important and positive messages. Like gaming's powerful. It is. Right. It is, absolutely. Mm. Have you heard of uh, folding at home? Oh, I haven't. No. Oh, it's like I, I'm actually I'm distrib- kind of shocked. Uh, it, yeah, it's yeah. distributed protein folding. And um, I was honestly hoping that this got even more popular during the pandemic because they leverage um, video card GP, GPU technology to do a bunch of number crunching to simulate protein folding. And there's actually also a game that you can play that simulates protein folding. And what this accomplishes um, is it helps out data researchers. This is actually one direct cause of the fact that we have a, um, a vaccine for coronavirus now, um, that oh, wow. this, this research data enabled them to accelerate the research because um, when the pandemic hit, and crypto was such a big thing. A bunch of people flipped over their crypto cards to crunching proteins instead. <laughs> and I was hoping that stuck around for a lot longer because we might have cured cancer by now. But that's really cool. Just, but, yeah, interesting um, how gaming and, and science and technology all relate like that. But you might have heard of CT at home because that was very popular yeah, a long time ago. Did you hear about that? Fresh, fresh it's in code. fact the same thing. You are crowdsourcing the compute power. And you download a client and then you get a data package and then you process it, load, uh, upload the, the results and then you get some credits for that. And I think uh, even City at Home transitioned over to the same technologies they're now using for distributing the client for folding at home. I think it's all the same software now and yeah, uh, you can yeah. select if you want to take part in um, city at home or in folding at home or whatever. And then you can even select which proteins you want to fold or so. i would never heard about a game that is integrated onto the uh, protein folding though. I saw there was mm-hmm. um, like a graphical demonstration of that when, when you had the yeah, screensaver active or so. But I, I didn't know that there's also a game integrated. Right on. So, um, okay, it works. I guess uh, one last question. Yeah, so, so a, a little bit got, tricky, maybe. Like our time's just about up for uh, for Alexander. So yeah, then one last question, and then we'll uh, tackle the VR, uh, the VR gaming news real quick. Um, what do you see in the future for VR? Because we've ah. we've heard about VR is dead. I don't think it is. It may be a niche, yeah, but what do you we think? We hear that every three months. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> VR is becoming more mainstream. And so I recently got back from the convention, AWE. I was talking a little bit with Cypher about it before the call. And like, I think the main thing I would encourage people with is to recognize that the VR technology, like, for the most part, I don't say it was stalled or it was delayed or it slowed down or is losing interest. It may appear that way to most of the public because, I mean, you, everybody's aware of like what headsets and what technology we had kind of pre-pandemic. And then it seemed like things stopped. And I just want to like explain to people, if you didn't know this, I don't, it didn't stop because technology research and development stopped. And you have a lot of companies building some amazing devices. And the biggest thing and the only thing holding them back, as far as I can tell, has been supply chain. Because mm. shipping of parts and components has been a major barrier to these companies and moving the technology forward. I mean, at a very practical level, I think everybody's seen this just with the availability of PS5s, right? <laughs> like oh, Steam Decks. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you've seen that with all other types of components and devices. And I would say that's very much so true for VR because we've talked to companies and you know they have things planned and they have things that, they want to put in people's hands, but you know, there's been some limitations with 
supply chain and shortages. And so the thing that I would say I'm most excited about is we're now getting back to where we can have our, these companies can build their devices, get them in the hands of people. And so I predict within like the next year, we're going to see a lot of new devices. We're going to see a lot of new technologies. Um, uh, one example of a technology that I've been working with is like the eye tracking. That's what I was talking to AWE uh, about, mm -hmm. working with Toby on new headsets. And I think a lot of those things are going to become standards in VR headsets. There's some cool technology coming. And I think it's finally going to hit the market in like the next year or so because things are normalizing. Oh, oh good. Okay. That's, That's a great perspective. I yeah. mean, a lot of people are so like... so much immersion to our VR experiences. Yeah. It's a ridiculous yeah. amount. Yes. I mean, a lot of people have been like, yeah, um, Valve is going to rescue the VR headset market with their new headset that has been like in the rumors called Deckard, where, where they are like um, the technology they have from the Steam Deck. Uh, what they learned, even though that device is also like, it has emerged from previous failures. So the Steam controller. I still have it, I still like it, but it failed on the market somehow. They stopped producing it. Then the Steam machines back then, mm -hmm. not enough games were working out of the box on those machines. They wanted to switch to Linux to be a little bit independent from Microsoft and their Windows 8 store and having to go through Microsoft certification for their client games, whatever. And everything merged into the Steam Deck. And the Steam Deck is not... A failure. I mean, they still cannot uh, sell enough units as are ordered. So there has been the rumor, and Valve even said that VR is a big market for them, and uh, the Steam Deck and the hardware will play a major role in VR. So maybe Valve will announce their new headset soon. As you mentioned, there will be new headsets coming. So maybe that is related to that. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. So have uh, you I love it because as a developer, like I'll just put my games on all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Give me more platforms. I will I will supply you with games. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I'm here for it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Alexander. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I really enjoyed it. It was yeah, a good conversation. All right. Thanks for having So I guess we're all getting coming to a close then. Yeah, I'll go ahead uh, and drop. See you all. all right. Have a good one. Yeah, Thanks for good. your time. And Thank see you. you soon. Yeah, unfortunately, right. Alexander had to head out because he had. Oh, I, I didn't know about uh, time frame. I, yeah, I was, uh, I was expecting about two hours, and he, he just confirmed like uh, about five minutes ago, so we're okay. No, no worries. All right. No worries. All right. Um, okay, this will there be was... tricky for Mr. Life Producer now <laughs> to do the <this> switch here. <laughs> Sorry, MLP. We we should probably switch over next um, to Video Ninja to make it. A yeah, easier. OBS Ninja. It was called before. Yeah, that was the plan. Yeah, uh, yeah but uh, we can like um, skip, so Alexander can go. Okay, then we skip those and come to an end here. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I say we uh, let's let's just get something together with uh, maybe a few Fever members and talk about those things in a couple of weeks. Right. Keep this thing going. Okay. Then let's uh, call it for today. Thanks for watching, everyone. This has been the Fever Teams, uh, Fever Dreams <laughs> from the Fever Team cast, um, season three, episode five, episode 18 in total. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, Alexander, for stopping in and uh, telling us about all the insight of a VR indie game developer. That was really interesting. Yeah, and so uh, check out their games. Uh, there is a Steam store page of their um, of their games from the developer where you can get those games. There's Virus Popper for free. There's Star Blazer, and there is um, Space Slurpees available. And Space Slurpees, when I saw that, yeah, it reminded me totally of Snake. <laughs> where uh, I, I was like, yeah, is this Snake in VR? And Alexander yes, just confirmed, yes, <laughs> it is Snake in VR. And that's pretty cool. So easy to learn. Right on. Um, you can also follow Star Kate Akate on Twitter, which is Star Kate Akate, their handle. And they have a link tree where you can yes, find the pages tree. of their site as well as 
um, their Discord, their Twitter, the games that are available. So check out those. Thank you very much for co-hosting with me, Cypher. You can catch Cypher on as Cypher Orion on all the platforms, which is at least Twitter and uh, Twitch. And mostly Twitter, Twitter and Twitch. Just Twitter and Twitch, all the all the necessary platforms. I, I Maybe TikTok. On, I'm on I'm on learned. YouTube, but I'm I'm working on. I'm not on TikTok. I, I have an account, but I'm not. I don't post on TikTok. Uh, we learned uh, it might be a good opportunity. <laughs> yes, this is true. This is very mm. true. Right on. So yeah, thank you so much for watching, everybody. We are going to raid. I'd say, let's raid yeah. somebody. Thank, thank you again for hosting. You're very welcome. My pleasure. And I will do it next time as well. Ha.